Hello, I'm Representative John Payne. It's my pleasure today to be here with Major Dick Winters. Major Winters is not only a constituent of mine in the 106th District, but he's a longtime friend. Dick, the shelling that occurred outside of Florida is depicted both in the book and in the miniseries as being very intense, very uh, deadly, a lot of casualties. Yes, right. Worst shelling you witnessed, the, I mean, compared to Normandy, Holland, Bastogne, I mean, it just seemed that way that the shelling in the woods was pretty bad. Well, the shelling was, there's a different kind of shelling. In Normandy, we're faced, the shelling that we're faced with at that point with airborne troops and so forth, and at that early stages, was mostly with 88s. That's direct fire and not indirect fire. Of course, we had some mortars, but uh, we didn't have the the shelling, the type of shelling that we had, say, in Holland or Bastogne. Because, say, in Holland then, uh, as it worked out, we were on the island again here. The Germans are on the north side, and they have the higher ground. And remember, they're not too far from home. So their resupply of ammunition is very good. They're on the high ground. They can see every little movement we make on the south side of the island uh, uh, while we're on the island. And so we're perfect targets for any movements that we make. And the shelling was brutal. And uh, if, when you live through that, you live through the worst. But it, again, it's a matter of where you happen to be at the time of the shelling. If you're in the center of a, uh, a cross fire, or, or of a concentration. There is nothing worse than that that can be imagined. And uh, it, it, I don't care where you are. Now you could be down the line a little bit and not be involved in that direct fire that you're under with a concentration. That's one thing. But uh, uh, not Bastogne. There again, we're under, when you mentioned Foy here, uh, I consider that past stone. Uh, so that the uh, artillery were under Bastogne, that was by far the worst that we received as a unit for everybody. Because we were, if you look at that map I just pointed out to you and shared with you here, of the units that had us surrounded at uh, Bastogne. If you look at the map, uh, you can see the units that have us surrounded. You'll see a, a lot of artillery. And uh, during the uh, demand for our surrender from the Germans, at uh, Christmas time, um, part of his, uh, the way he had that demand worded was the fact that uh, surrender or I'll shell you off the earth. I have the art, he had, in other words, he had the artillery, he felt, to do it. And there were times that we weren't too sure he was right. Uh, because when he concentrated that artillery, such as he did, on our area, 2nd Battalion, Company E, uh, like on the 9th of January. Uh, oh, it was brutal. And uh, uh, the picture here, Band of Brothers, speaks for itself. It does a very good job. It does a very good job in having you share the feelings of, of, uh, of that time. Incoming! Take cover! Take cover! Take cover! Come on! Find some cover! They got a zero! Find some cover! Find the box hole! Come on! Take cover! Take cover! Find 
Two things for our viewers that I picked up on me from my military experience, but one was pretty sharp that I just thought you said very quickly, without hesitation, 9th of January. You remembered that date like it was yesterday. No question. You, you had it right there that fast. And the other thing was most civilians would say January the 9th, but if we've been in the military, it's the 9th of January. Look, you live this every day. You live this every day. You have, you have recall, and uh, you don't live the whole thing every day, but there are segments that will pop up every day and any time of the day. And, of course, you're, you're keeping it to yourself. You're not going around talking about it. Well, we sure appreciate you talking about it. And I have, uh, as I talked to you and your wife before we started the interview, uh, the recent uh, publicity about the concentration camps and uh, Ike wanting all the troops to go there and see this so that nobody could ever say it didn't happen. And, and your quote of, now I know why I'm here. That's correct. Tell us just w what was your first thought when you saw it, Dick? It's uh, your first thought when you see it, it just stops you. You've never seen anything like this. It's a complete shock. It just stops every feeling of uh, emotion that you have. Uh, the horror of it is you could never imagine anything like this before. Uh, sure, you've been through the war and you've seen men killed and you've seen people, how they suffered in uh, France and Holland and Belgium and so forth, occupied countries. You've seen how they've suffered with uh, uh, short rushings, and, uh, but you've never imagined anything like this, uh, how you can take people and, and we also saw uh, displaced persons, of course, we were running into those for quite some time. And of course they were very thin and half starved, but uh, for their constant, for their uh, for their labor that they were putting out. But this, these camps, where they had the Jewish people and the descendants, the the dissenters uh, that the Germans had thrown in these camps, and the way they treat them was just unbelievable, and uh, you can never forget it. You can never forget it and never understand it, how anybody could think like this, act like this, do something like this to a fellow man. I can understand shooting a man, yeah. Uh, we've seen that down the line, uh, but not, not to this extent. Dick, the, uh, the eagle's nest, the mm. wine collection. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Like you've never seen before? This is another world, isn't another it? Another world? I mean, after, after all yeah. the training, yeah. Normandy, yeah. Holland, yeah. Bastogne, the yeah. bitter cold, yeah. the concentration camps, we've, all the horrors. We've just left the concentration camps a couple days before. And now you're in Hitler's private mountaintop resort that right. the best of money could buy. Completely another world. Complete another world. We've left, we've left the concentration camps about uh, three days ago. And here we are in Birch's Garden. And the people who uh, basically the leaders that were responsible for these camps, you're now looking at them and uh, you're seeing how they live and everything is, uh, is just ideal. Better than anything you knew back home, as a matter of fact. 
and I'm not talking about the fact that they had running water and the toilets. Uh, they have everything and uh, a very plush life, obviously. So to uh, walk up to the door of a family and say, I'm moving in, I'm giving you 15 minutes to move out, and to have somebody on the other side say, no, I'm not moving. That makes up your mind in a hurry. Say, well, I'm moving in right now. Sort of like uh, Colonel Chase was with me about being on time. On time. Well, that's the way you are right at this point. You are not taking anything like that. My men are going to have shelter and the best for a day or two here. And so it went. And uh, so we just took over. We were occupying. I know some people wouldn't approve of that, but after what we've been through, I had no problems at all. My conscience didn't bother me at all. It depicts the uh, the wine, the uh, the uh, party, the yeah. uh, almost plush surroundings that Hitler had yeah. up there, yeah. uh, the cars. Yes. Uh, after all that time, it was it a little bit like the guys could let off some steam, relax a little bit. Maybe yes. even from some of the yes. horrors of what you just yes. saw in the concentration yes. camp? Yes. Just for a short... Short time. Just a short time. But uh, it's important at that time, I think, as a leader, and as you should know. And I'm, no, you are a leader, so you know there are times you've got to ease off. At times you've got to give your people a day off once in a while. And... Uh, this is this is the time to do it. Knock it off, back off, let them be themselves. Forget all the regulations and uh, the army way of doing things. So yes, for a day or two there, we had an opportunity to do it, and that's the way we did it. Throughout the uh, the book, the movie uh, depicts that men when they were wounded would almost uh, sign themselves out of the hospital to get back to the unit. That's no, correct. I mean, that, that desire to get out of the hospital, to get out of the aid unit and get That's back correct. with their brothers was compelling. What drove that, Dick? This bonding we've talked about for some time here today. And we've uh, shared that from uh, the time that we went in basic training, this bonding that we talked about, now here we are in the last days of the war. And this bonding uh, only becomes, it becomes, it becomes, oh, how to say it, how to express it. It becomes so strong that uh, you do not want to leave your friends. You don't want to even think about uh, being with any place but your friends, your family. Uh, these are the guys that you went to war with, and uh, these are fellows you know that uh, will take care of you uh, so that you won't be hungry and that you'll be taken care of and you want to take care of them. It's a two-way street. In Ambrose's book, uh, Spears is, uh, supposedly shoots a non-com who's drunk in Normandy. In the movie, in the series, they talk about Spears coming down to the, to the prisoners. Uh, was it more or less a depiction to try to show, as Saving Private Ryan did, that American troops did shoot men who were trying to surrender? Or do you really think, or do you know, that those incidents happened? Uh, enough said. <laughs> you see that file over there that we talked about? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, this was, this is one of the problems Ambrose had when we finished with the book. Simon & Schuster came to him one day, the legal department, Simon & Schuster. They read the book and they visualized publishing this book. And they visualized problems with lawsuits as a result of publishing the book. 
and they do not want to get into little lawsuits. Publishing this little book, Band of Brothers, which is no big deal. Here you had all these examples of uh, accusations made about this guy shooting prisoners of war, which is strictly against all the rules of war and the way we normally think. And there was a, a number of examples of this, but uh, Spears is a good example of the, the point I'm going to make here. And, uh, uh, for example, uh, I accused Nixon of being an alcoholic. There's another one. So they, uh, this call from Ambrose this one evening says, Dick, we got this big problem. I don't know what we're going to do about it. And he went down this list that Simon and Schuster was concerned about with lawsuits. And say, Steve, relax. I'll take care of it for you. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm sticking my neck out here. I'll take care of it for you. I know Nixon, so I know I can, there will not be any problem with Nixon. I can show you that. On Spears, was another case. I picked up the telephone and I got in touch with Sparky Spears. And we were very, very close. Talk about bonding. If you remember, I was responsible for making him company commander, company, and we were very close. I said, Sparky, you know, these stories have been going around for years, and everybody says that nobody saw it directly. I'm going to ask you, are they true? He said, oh, yeah. Yeah, they're true, Dick. Good. Well, here's my problem, Sparky. Simon & Schuster is very concerned about lawsuits in this thing. Oh, look, he said, no problem. You want me to put that in a letter? Oh, gladly, and he did. He put it in a letter. That letter is in those files. There's never been a problem with... Simon & Schuster never had a problem. Nobody's ever had a problem with that thing because it's a true story. Carlisle. Dick, talk about the casualties. Uh, I mean, throughout the campaign, you had men who were killed, men who were wounded, uh, men that came back after being wounded, and some did not come back. Correct. You as an officer, how did that impact you? How did that affect you as you saw those casualties and you, they were your friends obviously some of them were friends you were oh, close to yeah. them oh, oh yes 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 uh, it, the, the feeling that leaves you is how long will this go on and uh, will this go on forever and you reach the point when you see people around you dropping basically every day. Uh, I hope when it's my turn that it isn't too bad. It's not a matter of if you know it's going to be your turn sooner or later. If you stick around long enough, you just hope it won't be too bad. Hope to live through it. You spent time, England, Holland, France, Germany. You, you made a comment earlier in the interview about building the men, coming yeah. up to a farmhouse or on a, a hotel or whatever kind of a building and saying, you've got 15 minutes to get out. My That's men correct. are coming in. We're going to at least have a day or a, a good night's sleep. That's correct. Uh, what was the difference between the Holland and France and the Germans as far as the receptiveness and the, and the quarters themselves, the housing themselves. Uh, uh, the the question is uh, the difference between France, Holland, and German as far as the receptiveness. I mean, I think in the, at least in the movie, it depicts that uh, maybe you had more hospital conditions or were received better than you thought in Germany. Oh, definitely. Uh, definitely. Relate to that a little bit on what were the were the French 
not receptive, or was it the just French the Germans were, were more? The French were not receptive, and and looking back on it, I can see, uh, I can excuse them, because the ones that I do know are excellent, excellent people, and very, very good friends to this day. Keep in touch with them. But keep in mind, this is Normandy. We're just establishing the beachhead. How long are they going to be here? Are these guys going to be here tomorrow? Are they going to be gone tomorrow? Will we be back under occupation next week with the Germans? And uh, because we're just establishing a beachhead to bring troops in over this beachhead. So the French ought to be a little bit careful how friendly they were. Now in Holland, uh, they're, after all this occupation, like the French, they're looking forward, and the war's been on for a while, they're aware of the fact that we are moving along with this and there's hope for them to, uh, for freedom again. They've had, they've had a couple months to think about this and be ready for it. So the, naturally their reception was different than the French, in all fairness, because they were hoping it and uh, that you stay there. So they were, they were more open. Now you want to talk about the Germans. Well, the Germans, uh, their homes were much better than the French or the Dutch. They had the running water, the toilets, the facilities that we were looking for. And their concern is for their own well-being. How rough are these guys going to be as they are now occupying Germany? So there's a different frame mind as you go down the line through the war in the different time periods. And you can understand it. You can understand the French, you can understand the, the Dutch, and I can understand the Germans. Can we talk about the uh, little bit about command structure? I don't know that all of our viewers understand what a division is, what a company is, how many men are in a division. I mean, we have people talk about the 101st Airborne. How many, how many men were in a division like the 101st Airborne? Uh, roughly 10,000 men. How about a regiment? Regiment, 2,500 men. And then a company? A company is roughly 140 men, and uh, in a battalion there's roughly 600 men. So at times, if you were at full strength, which you weren't most of the war, right. you might have had 140 men in a company. That's correct. But most times, you were probably below the 100. That's correct. Were, were the examples given of the 101st probably common throughout the European oh, battle? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, the situation that uh, they're using in the miniseries here uh, uh, this is normal. This is this is average. Everybody else is going through the same thing we are. They're suffering just as many casualties as we are, going through the same thing. So we're not on you. This is average that you're looking at here, with company and uh, the rest of them have done just as many and won just as many battles as we have. But we were we think we we're a little bit better. But uh, uh, when you want to be fair about it, no, we were all in it together. You, when you cross the Rhine and you get into Germany and you find those homes that are better than in France or in Holland, and, yeah. and you think, now we're, now we're on their soil. Now the resistance should really happen. Now it should get tighter. It didn't seem that way in a lot of the depictions that it was any worse there than it was at Bastogne or or in Normandy or anything else. The battles were the battles. The battles, what, were the battles. Was that the way it felt, Dick? Yes, basically. But in getting going uh, through these different campaigns and so forth, uh, keep in mind that when we got in Germany, and we got into down into Dusseldorf and down through, actually there was very few battles as such. It became more of an occupation. The German army had basically given up 
and so you're not getting into the firefights you were before. Uh, you're not under the artillery concentrations and, and machine gun fire and so forth that you were before. No, that had eased off considerably, changed dramatically. At what point do you think uh, you, or at least the men, started thinking about, this is over, I could be going home? Hagenau. Starting, thoughts start going through your mind uh, uh, along the Motor River as we were occupying Hanover, Hagenau, that you could see this change take place, which is after Bastogne, a week or two after Bastogne. This came down through, and you could feel it. You could feel the intensity of it was easing off. Uh, you were staggering, but uh, they were a lot, hurt a lot more so than you are. So yeah, the intensity eased off right after Bastogne. That was the last great battle. Mm -hmm.